Welcome everyone to FanCon 2020, a virtual convention with the fans in mind. My name is Phil Maki, and I'm so excited to be your host. Halloween is upon us, and that makes it the perfect time to discuss a fan favorite. This is the Scooby-Doo panel. First guest is known for creating Cartoon Network originals like The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy and Evil Con Carne. Most recently, he directed, wrote, and produced the original movie Happy Halloween, Scooby-Doo. Please welcome Maxwell Adams. Hey, everybody. Hey, I love your background. Oh, hey, thanks. I You're love out. your background. Yeah, thank it's like you. we're both in an episode of a mysterious spooky show it is it's very much like that. although like i i think i feel like mine is a little bit more of a point and click adventure game <laughs> like yours see, yours actually looks more uh classic scooby than mine does i think mine's oh more, there you go i i just i'm looking modern. for the hidden spatula somewhere behind me that's what i'm yeah. trying to find i just feel like that's highlight you want to i do feel like you need to click on the well because there's always something down there yes and then we can look down the well and, and what will we find that, that's the mystery i guess but uh well it's very appropriate that we're already talking about mysteries <laughs> so um thanks for being here first of all it's yeah thanks for having me yeah of course well when, the last time we spoke was uh for stay tuned and so what's funny i was kind of going over that in my in my memory banks and i was re remembering you said well my next project is something i really can't talk about but it's got mysteries involved and i remember that and then i'm guessing it's the thing we're here to talk about today i can't think of another mystery so i think so <laughs> that's the new mystery is what what were you yeah, what, what was i thinking back then I don't know. <laughs> when i first heard about uh the well this <laughs> happy halloween scooby-doo when i first heard about this being released my my initial reaction to it was, how has there not been a Halloween themed direct to video Scooby Doo movie already? Like, wasn't that already a thing? And I guess I it guess was. it was. Like, or I what? think it was, and okay. just either nobody wanted to acknowledge it, or they just wanted to make the scene newer. I don't know, but I guess there was one uh, uh, about a goblin, and and maybe one other one. Um, I actually watched most of the Scooby Doo DVDs leading up to this one but i i didn't see those but apparently they do exist they did the follow-up to the the series for the 13 ghosts they did a a wrap-up movie for that mm -hmm. which you know that's that it's a long time coming <laughs> right yeah yeah like i guess that's kind of the nice thing about these is warner brothers puts out like two of these a year i think so there's a lot of opportunities to I think now they're they're kind of going back and doing that where there there's like there is this 50 year history of the property so you can go back and be like well we never answered this question and there are yeah. mysteries and uh, even uh, you and I were talking not long ago about Mystery Incorporated a little bit which is where my background's from but like that does go back in into their pasts and uh, just sort of I guess deeper aspects of their characters than than just enjoying Scooby snacks and solving mysteries. <laughs> Yeah, well, I like that you brought that up because, you know, it's kind of become um, an, an American institution, so to speak. Maybe, maybe institution is the wrong word, but American uh, uh, staple. But basically, because I, I, I don't think of a lot of content that we've generated ourselves that wasn't ripped off of something that came from Europe or something like that and made our own. This is sort of a thing that we just kind of generated and it and it keeps perpetuating year after year yeah it's it's cool and it's inspired you know other things buffy the vampire slayer uh supernatural w was it a direct inspiration uh, i i know there's you know i don't know if if supernatural is a direct inspiration but i know that buffy was okay supposedly you can link up each buffy character to a scooby-doo <laughs> I've never heard. I like that theory. I've never really heard that. That's awesome. But yeah, so starting back in 1969, there were a collection of cartoons from Hanna-Barbera that were pretty much the same premise. 
Funky Phantom and Speed Buggy. Yeah, like I think back then there was definitely sort of this assembly line yeah. attitude toward it all. Like even right. the way that they they produced the episodes. Like uh, we had a guy on Billy and Mandy that did backgrounds for The Simpsons, and he'd be like, well, "I think we did a couple episodes that actually had." Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I think I said Simpsons, but I meant Flintstones. Uh, and since he had done backgrounds for the Flintstones, every time we'd have a Flintstones reference, he would do the background and and <laughs> he would do it like the old school way. And it would just be like paint roller the ground, paint roller the sky, draw the thing in and you're done. And I think right. you know, that was part of the thing was just like, we've, we've got a success with Scooby-Doo. So let's see how many more times we can yeah. do that. We'll swap Scooby out with a car or with a different animal. <laughs> Right, but it was always this collection of, of teens, and yeah. there was they were always trying to solve some mystery. Why did Scooby and the gang? Why did that catch on? Uh, I think I, I don't know. You know, I I don't know if how many of them came before or after Scooby. I think Scooby was maybe the first, if not the first, of, of that group. So that's it might have had that going for it. But I think also it's just the characters are also distinct and and easily recognizable. And like on top of it all, it's not. Like they're always friends. It's sort of a not not quite to the extent of like Bill and Ted, where they'll just blow off anything. Uh, like you can have a little bit of interpersonal tension within the Scooby Gang, but it's like they're they're tight. You know, it's they're fun yeah. to watch and and they're reliable. Like as characters, you know what to expect from them, more or less. Is that what spoke to you growing up watching them uh, to keep them in your mind to this day? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it was that. Uh, it was also, I, I loved monsters as a kid. I think we might have talked about this before, but like they also just scared the living daylights out of me. So uh, like I, I remember like breaking down crying when the, the Chud trailer came on TV and my parents were like, what is happening? Uh, and like looking back on that movie now, no. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing scary in there. But, uh, well, you know, and, and the way the Scooby gang ha handled it was like, you know, this is... You know, we're gonna get to the bottom of it and figure out what's what's real and what what's not. And I I think that was part of, I guess, helped me come to terms with my my fear of the irrational as a as a child. And then you embraced it, and now you now a lot of your work has this macabre underpinning to it. Yeah, yeah. I I love monsters and I love science, so I think that's where it is for me with Scooby Doo. It's just like it's all there. Well, monsters and science are absolutely prevalent in uh, Happy Halloween Scooby-Doo. Absolutely. I don't want to spoil too much for people that haven't seen it, but I will just say that there's definitely some some technological marvels happening in the film. And in looking back over the, the history of Scooby-Doo, I, which I don't know all of it. I just have like bits and pieces for me. Um, but it did have a new Scooby-Doo movies feeling to it. Um, with the guest star of Alvira and Bill Nye, was that was that an intentional callback? Uh, yeah, like the the way these work generally is uh, uh, like either either you're on staff directing these for like forever, or you're just kind of passing through. And I I felt like for me, I'm probably just passing through on this. So this was this was my Scooby Doo moment and sort of my love letter to childhood Scooby Doo. Uh, so it was all that stuff I was just talking about, but also like, you know, just weird, fabulous guest stars. Like uh, I used to love it. Uh, and there's a Three Stooges reference, but I'd loved it when the Three Stooges would show up with Scooby-Doo and like you get Sonny and Cher and just all sorts of anybody. Moral, be anybody. Moral <laughs> yeah. Batman and Robin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and Batman and Robin. So that's that was uh, like I knew I wanted to, to pull stuff from because I could the the Warner Brothers catalog a little bit and get some of. The more fantastical guest stars in there but it, you know also have just people that i thought were cool and worked well in the story well you know you brought scarecrow into it which uh i guess that means gotham and the scooby-doo gang are part of the same universe now is that how that works uh i i like i said i watched uh a lot of scooby-doo as a kid but i also did a, a massive catch-up when i was starting this thing i was just binging all these scooby-doo movies and they're just they're kind of all over the place like so I decided like everything that has happened in Scooby-Doo is canon. <laughs> so I'm just going to take like the pieces I, I like uh, and use that stuff. Sure. Well, I suppose with Batman and Robin was making a guest appearance back in the day. Yeah. They're... So so there's there was even a full on Batman uh, and Scooby-Doo DVD a couple years ago bat with uh, the Batman Brave and the Bold show. So 
Yes, that's yes, that's right. So you know, he Scarecrow worked surprisingly well. I actually really liked what what you guys did with him. And since you had so much responsibility on this on this uh, film, because writing, directing, and producing, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of people tackle that these days. Was that uh, does it make things easier because you just have to confer with yourself, or is it just more work? Uh, it's a little of both. <laughs> like it's uh, it's. It's cool because, like, how many times can you say you've written, produced, and directed something? Not, not too many. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, on, on the other hand, it does mean that, like, you know, you're taking on all those responsibilities, so it does become a lot of stuff to do at a certain point. Sure. Okay. What was? Uh, is there an aspect of those three roles that you kind of really start to sort of have the most fun? Um, I mean, sort of generating ideas and just being, you know, wild and creative, that's always fun. Uh, uh, the sort of, I guess, the sad and or wonderful thing is, uh, like, I, I've written things and then not followed through. And, you know, sometimes they come out okay. But if, if I can actually follow through the entire process and, and, and have some sort of fine-grained control over it, then, like, I'm more satisfied. <laughs> I can only speak for myself. You don't have to compromise as much as what you're saying. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. W was this a, a similar experience to working on Billy and Mandy, or would you say you had uh, less control here because it's an existing property? Um, like I, I had a lot of control over the story in that they were just like, hey, go write a cool Halloween story. <laughs> but I, I felt like it was like less control because it was, it's, it's sort of a movie on a TV budget, but without the sort of build up or, or the camaraderie that you build, like leading up to an actual TV show. This is just sort of like you pop in, you do your time and, and you pop out. Okay. Uh, but yeah, o overall, uh, good time. <laughs> good short time. <laughs> right. I, something I like about, about the series and about this film in particular is how the characters are, are now... Uh, the formula that they they found themselves in is so embedded in the canon that it's self-referential. You know what I mean? With, with oh like... yeah, just uh, I mean, I, I I'm not the first person to start uh, scooting no, I... with like you know yeah. somebody getting their mask pulled off, but yeah, like it's it's there now, and you you can do stuff like that because right. You know, you know it's coming. <laughs> and right, you, you, we have Daphne in the very beginning of this saying, "Come on," she's got her phone, she's recording, she's like, "Come on, you're gonna say." It wasn't for you meddling. She's like trying to lead the bad guy to say the thing, you know? Yeah, I I like to give myself extra challenges when I'm doing things. And, and one of the challenges that I gave myself on this was sort of just pushing the boundaries of the formula without hopefully breaking it. <laughs> like, I think it's all in there, but hopefully I've, I've remixed it enough that it's not just another Scooby-Doo. That's what I wanted to ask you. How do you know, as a writer, uh, when you're when you're the steward of something that's not a, a originally from you, um, which parts to keep and which parts that you can sort of go off in different tangents? Uh, well, again, that that was the nice thing where my boss on this is is someone I'm friends with, and we've had he was my boss on Billy and Mandy, so we've had this long relationship, and it's very easy to to talk about things, and I kind of know what he expects out out of me and what I expect out of him, so. It's a it's a pretty easy relationship, uh, so not a, not a lot of pushback. Uh, and I didn't I don't think I did anything really pushbackable. Like I don't think there's anything unscooby in there. No, uh, I but... I actually think there's some some very Maxwell Adams y thing. Yeah, but but uh, I think one of the the big sort of shifts for this style of Scooby Doo anyway was was Daphne. And like I said, I, I sort of took everything as canon. So I was watching Be Cool Scooby-Doo and I was like, well, that's a that's a fun take on Daphne because I like that Daphne isn't the damsel in distress anymore. But when you just swing the pendulum fully the other way and she, you know, just kicks everything's ass and eh, how interesting is that? But then if you layer like other stuff on top of that, then she's more more human again, which I like. So let's talk about Daphne a little bit. I'm glad you brought her up because she was very different than what I was expecting, and uh, but in, in like you said, it was in an interesting presentation. We kind of get this fangirl side of her that we don't typically see with uh, Elvira, and there is a little bit of a cute 
um, back and forth uh, volleying of, of dialogue between the two of them. Was that fun to write? Uh, yeah, yeah. That just sort of, uh, once I decided that that's who Daphne was and I started writing stuff with her and Elvira, like that was a lot of fun. <laughs> she, I think she... there might have even been some stuff I had to cut out because it was just too much. Okay. Well, she was very quippy. I don't remember Daphne ever being that quippy. Um, yeah, I don't, I've, I, part of that's probably just me. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> that was Maxwell being quippy writing through maybe, Daphne. But I, I feel like more of the quippiness comes from Elvira, maybe. I don't know. I'll have to go back and watch it. Who's your favorite character to, to write then? Uh, honestly, I like them all. I love them all. Like, I, I really did enjoy writing this and, like, I'm not a big guy for, like, library properties, and I'm always like, please make something new. But, like, if I had to do a library property, like, I could be happy doing this. Like, like w even with Daphne, I don't know what the reasoning behind Be Cool Scooby-Doo, I don't know what their reason was for, for doing what they did to Daphne. And I, I have sort of my own take on, on that style of Daphne, and, and I have my own Fred, and, like, there are stories for... I, I would actually love to do like five in a row where I just kind of address <laughs> each character. Uh, oh, okay. I don't really see that happening, but yeah, I, I love these characters, I guess. Well, I mean, maybe, maybe the fans can demand it. That could be something that, that <laughs> uh, people request on social media or something. Sure, like that. Go, go for it. You never know. <laughs> you never know. It's true. Well, you mentioned the design of, of um, Be Cool Scooby-Doo, which I, I recently... Uh, witnessed because it was not not a show that I ever really had access to. But as one of the uh, special features on this mm. disc, they they ended up putting a Halloween themed episode of Be Cool Scooby Doo on there, and it's got a very Family Guy design, and the humor is very uh, very good and quick. Since we now know they can take the characters and design them differently, because that's what they've been doing. How did you land on this, the, like the design of this particular movie? Um, I mean, when this when this was originally, I guess, pitched to me, it was, "Hey, do you want to write a a 50th anniversary Scooby Doo movie?" And I was like, "Yeah, that sounds amazing." Uh, and then as time went on, I was like, "Oh, well, we're not going to make that deadline." So it became not 1969. 50 year difference. But by that point, I'd already decided I, I wanted it to be really sort of heavily grounded in 1969. So the designs themselves are the old Scooby Doo, where are you designs? Uh, and there was, you know, there was other stuff I wanted to do with color, and we just didn't really have time. But okay. But there was some musical cues that felt 60s esque. Yeah, that was always sort of baked in, at least from when I started writing it. Okay. Nice. And you know, I. There's a, there's a big sequence that happens in the movie. It's actually longer than I was expecting that sequence to be, but the show sort of takes on a uh, wacky races feeling for a little while. Oh yeah, like that's the other sort of challenge I gave myself was like, can I do like a Mad Max movie? And a <laughs> Mad Max movie do. Uh, so really, it's it's 1969, but also there's a lot of stuff from just my childhood times of watching Scooby Doo. So it's very there's a lot of 1980s horror and monster references going on in the background. Yeah, absolutely. And let's so, say, yeah, you got monsters, you have tech. There's all this uh, working into it with drones, which is very keeping it very grounded in our current time um, with all these callbacks to stuff from a previous time. Yeah, yeah, that's it's uh, I guess it's like bat. It is like Batman in, in a way with Scooby-Doo, where it's just like year are we in i don't know everybody's got cell phones but the cars are all from a different era so huh <laughs> whenever they need we need them to be yeah it's i don't know i like stuff like that it doesn't bother me <laughs> <laughs> yeah was the combination of mystery ink and elvira was that something that was um in your mind in the back of your mind is something you wanted to do one day or was it more like the, the heads of warner brothers came to you and said hey we really want to combine these different people together and go only in the case of elvira really uh warner brothers was like hey want to write a halloween movie and elvira is probably attached so i was like that's fantastic uh and it wasn't really until i guess toward the end of like my first or second draft and i'd been binge watching all these scooby-doos but then i realized uh that the one i was writing was was technically part of a trilogy 
<laughs> so I had to go back and like cram these other two episodes, and I was like, oh, Elvira's actually in one of these. <laughs> so there was sort of this this strange disconnect in that moment, but uh, I, I think I got it all in there. One thing I regret not really addressing was, I guess, the mystery machine was de destroyed in the previous movie, so then it's just spontaneously back in this one. Uh, okay, so, that, so I'm, I'm a little confused. So, I, look, I don't know all of the movies. Uh, what trilogy is this part of? Uh, it's uh, Return to Zombie Island, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the one before that right now. Okay. Uh, but but really, the only thing that ties them together was, I, I guess, the long-term plan was to have the sheriff be the villain. So that was sort of my my one restriction from Warner Brothers was like, the sheriff's the villain. <laughs> So I had okay. to find a way to that make that work at that point, but they do reference that there was a few references uh, to some other monster where that sheriff was uh, on the right. Scene. Yeah, so because he had to be the villain, I had to give him some sort of backstory, and that was just you know, unfortunately, there's. I guess I could have made him a previous villain. That would have taken more research, though. But. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny about his design, and maybe you did this on purpose, but his face kind of looks like a character from the old series. Uh, yeah, the since we were doing sort of the the uh, Scooby Doo, where are you designs? Uh, we had this great uh, designer, Dan Cheer, who took like the ones from you know the sheriff from uh, Return to Zombie Island, kind of redesigned him in that classic style. Same with Elvira. And then you do all this this sort of play with. Uh, kind of a Superman effect where Superman takes off his glasses, you know, and, and then he's Superman. You had sort of that play. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some dumb stuff in there, sure. No, I'm not saying it's dumb. I'm saying it, it's funny. Like, I thought that was a pretty cool little little uh, way to add some comedy, but also um, make it make this tongue-in-cheek nod to the audience that, look, these characters are all kind of the same. <laughs> Sure, and you know, it was just sort of me playing with the unmasking idea as well. Like, yeah, like they so, unmask him, and nobody's there, and then they unmask him or remask him, I guess. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and you even get Elvira involved in it at the very end. I won't, I won't say what the, what that is to people watching this right now, but you do a little. Oh, bit. The very end, yeah, yeah. I was uh, that was actually the the one, I guess, potential thing that could have gone the other way with Warner Brothers, which uh, they were like, we don't think she's going to like this. Uh, so so please don't do it. And then when she came in to record, I was like, hey, do you mind? <laughs> and she was like, no, this is great. So, Oh, well, good. Well, I mean, you want you want everybody to be on board, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, Warner Brothers puts two of these out uh, a year, not two Halloween specials, mind you, just two Scooby-Doo specials. Um, and it seems like that they're not giving it much oomph or pizzazz. We don't get a Blu-ray release. Um, the the special features being the three past cartoons, they look like they were ripped off of VHS in, in some instances. Uh, is that ever a discussion point when you're working? Is there ever like a, uh, a question about, hey, what's, what's the aspect ratio? What's... Yeah, I did notice that it was 720p, I think. Uh, which is, that's like low res for a decade ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which is weird. Like, I feel like I don't know the the, the details of the cost of producing an enormous number of, of DVDs, but I would imagine that pressing a 1080p DVD as opposed to a 720 DVD is probably not that different. I don't know. <laughs> No, but no. yeah, like uh, at, a, at a certain point, like I'm just, a, I'm kind of a hired gun, so... Sure. Uh, in this case, like I, I'm basically a freelance writer, director, producer, and like that all, all sort of the the, I guess big scale decisions are made before or after I show up. Okay, so if you can walk walk us through that a little bit, um, from like how do you get invited to do a project, and then at what point are they like cool piece? We're gonna go ahead and just make this happen now. You've done your thing. Like what? Where is those those boundaries? Where are those? Um, I mean, I guess there's there's like a department that kind of decides specifically for these Scooby Doo's, uh, probably other DVDs as well. But they're like, you know, they do their focus group and they're like, we need a Halloween one, which thankfully is the one that that I came in for. But 
I know there's like one coming up that's like Scooby Doo meets Courage the Cowardly Dog or Scooby Doo meets uh, somebody else. Or... So it could it could be almost anything, and it's not really. It's not like somebody's coming in and being like, "Hey, I want to make this specific kind of Scooby Doo." So it was just sort of kismet for me that this this happened, uh, and it only happened because I happened to know, you know, the executive that was in charge of <laughs> the Scooby Doo. So, so it's a conversation. Uh, he just approaches you and says, "Hey, I'm doing this thing. Do you want to be involved?" And that's that's really the entry point. Yeah, for for me, for this one, that that was it. And yeah, I came in and and did my stuff, and then. I don't know, like, if I were still at Warner Brothers, I don't know if I would be looped in on more things regarding this or not. Okay, and that's a good point because I don't, I don't know how how widespread knowledge that is, but not everybody is uh, a full time employee when they do these things. They're brought in as an independent contractor, right? Uh, at this, when I started this, I was doing development for Warner Brothers. Um, and generally, when you're doing development, they want you doing something else as well. So you're saving money. <laughs> so uh, that that's sort of what this was. Was like, hey, you're developing something, but like, do you want to do this at the same time? So, so, so saving money. Let's talk about saving money a little bit um, in in a, a corporate animation atmosphere. What does that literally translate to? Is it, hey, we're only going to have 25 animators and t instead of 35 or is it is it more uh, uh nuanced than that uh, it's i don't know <laughs> okay. like it's such a hard question to answer because okay. like as little as i was looped in on like the the budget and the finances for for like billy and mandy i i feel like in the last decade or so like that's sort of been actively hidden from artists like it's, it's just out of your pay grade realm. yeah so i don't i genuinely don't know what okay. people make anymore or or what things cost and it it does make my job harder in that like it's hard to argue for something that you need more money for when somebody's telling you you don't have money and you you're like well i don't know if i do or not <laughs> so <laughs> okay is there is but, there but, uh, but yeah i mean i could talk about this yeah. all day because it's it's annoying i mean i i understand capitalism and how it works but at the same time like it is i just want to you know <laughs> you just want to make stuff you, you just wanna... yeah i just i want to make stuff i, yeah. I want to you know i i want to have the resources I, I don't think i'm making like foolish decisions but at, at a certain point you're like i need this thing and sometimes you just don't get it <laughs> okay so so can you give me an example of a thing that you were able to get that you were like, I, this is just vital. Uh, let me well, I mean, for, for this show in particular, I guess, sure. this is, I don't know if this is really answering the question, but, uh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We, we had, uh, like a really tight schedule. So, um, and, and we're doing a car chase, which, you know, normally Scooby-Doo doesn't do. And originally I was like, well, how am I going to pull this off? Uh, so, I uh, I started doing it, uh, doing or making these mock-up uh, moving highway backgrounds based on stuff that I had done for this personal project for myself, uh, where it's just sort of flat planes moving by. It's just like insane multiplane essentially. Uh, but what we ended up doing was uh, because our our schedule was so tight, we found this artist who was uh, uh, sort of a concept artist for feature films. Uh, so he went in and just like basically built everything in, in 3D super quick. Uh, and then we had our painters go in and paint it. And then the Korean studio actually took those. And rather than doing the plane thing, they just built everything. Uh, but it, I guess the point is it was it was sort of a fight to get to that point. But we needed it because that highway stuff is just so busy. Like we had to have like a real solution and we couldn't just leave it up to fate. <laughs> Well, and and I think for for all intents and purposes, it worked out for you because Scooby Doo has has always had these um, montage uh, chase sequences, these these you know set to music and things like that, and and you've got this massive car chase. So it, that's a that's a creative way to take something familiar and maybe make it new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
how how did working on Billy and Mandy help you for like, prepare you for something like this? I mean, it, it's exactly the same movie as the Billy and Mandy Halloween special. So, <laughs> so you you, re you really just took it out of you dusted it off and you put new characters. Yeah. That's yeah. all. Okay, all right. Just want to make sure. Uh, no the 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 fun part about that is, I guess, that it was the reason that I have again like living pumpkins and a and a guy with a pumpkin on his head. Like that was all just sort of convergent evolution where i started thinking about this halloween special and then i'm like well it's a scooby-doo halloween special so i need a good halloween monster and i'm like just about every halloween monster is a scooby-doo monster already <laughs> so like what do you do that's not you know a vampire or a werewolf or a ghost or a and then eventually i was like well okay pumpkins <laughs> and then i kind of tied that into the the scarecrow and the gas and i was like okay i guess I guess I'm in it. I think it all works. <laughs> I think it's a good combination. Yeah, it was sort of, I, I kind of like that, you know, it's a flashback to something I did before, but just remixed in a very different way. <laughs> right. So we don't know if we're going to see more Maxwell Adams meets Scooby-Doo. Uh, uh, no, I, it, it certainly won't be any time in the near future. I'm sure they're three or four more deep in by now. Uh, yeah. I did a little bit of comedy punch up on the next one, uh, but. Yeah, not not in the foreseeable future, though I would love to do it. Were you invited to work on Scoob? Because that's the other big movie that came out for, for Scooby-Doo this year. Uh, no, I think actually the reason I ended up doing this was because the people that normally make the Scoobies got pulled onto Scoob or went onto Scoob. Oh, okay. Uh, I think. Do you feel like that was a better fit for you or would you have rather worked on, on Scoob? I think it would have been less fun in some ways. It probably would have been as fun in some ways. I'm sure it would have just been me sitting in a room spitballing ideas, which is great. But but uh, I like that I got the opportunity to just sort of take something, you know, from the seed all the way to the pumpkin seed into the line. Yeah. All the way to a big fat pumpkin. <laughs> right. And you mentioned time. Uh, what kind of time went into this? What what was that uh, schedule like? Um, I mean, it's it's essentially these are done on a, a TV schedule. But again, without that sort of knowing everybody. So it's, I, th I think this was also a little bit truncated. So I don't know. It was it was written over the course of a couple of weeks. We probably had six or seven weeks of boarding. I think that was another thing I got was maybe a little more time for boarding. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's more time in there. There's design going on simultaneously sometimes which isn't great but uh there was there was enough time in there where like i could go back in and tweak some things uh i boarded the, the opening title sequence and uh some of the stuff with scarecrow on the truck i think did you design any of the characters um i took a i have a rough drawing of scarecrow which is basically what he ended up looking like um i think i might have done a couple of the pumpkins but uh, we had a we had a great team of people. Oh my gosh, the uh, I'm gonna get his name wrong. Probably Damon Moran. He did all our vehicles. Like they're so good. They're so good. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of a major plot point in this film. Is we lose the mystery machine and we get this Bill Nye machine. So that's that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pe people love the mystery machine. I don't I don't know what they're gonna think of it. I know. Uh, permanent change, too. They're never going to get the old one back. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a reason why nowadays vehicles have to be CG? Is it just is it too hard to animate vehicles? With, um, um, in you could do it any number of ways. Uh, I think it's at this point, it's just easier. Like if if I didn't want to do CG vehicles, like I would have to be really specific about how the board artists handled their shots and and the angles they were from and like you just really have to be careful about not doing things that are gonna look inherently ugly like having you know these anytime you're doing things with like weird camera angles and perspective in tv animation it's just like a recipe for disaster <laughs> uh it's boarded here in the states right yes and then are there keyframes done here as well or does none of it uh, get no no uh i mean you can get uh, and, and this is again only for for this project. Like, there's different studios and different projects handle things all sorts of different ways. But what was the question? <laughs> oh, 
Where where do they animate it? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, this was animated in South Korea. South Korea and yes, none by, of, none by of, Emation, who did uh, who, who say again? Uh, by Emation, who did the vast majority of uh, Billy and Mandy and Evil Concarnate. Oh, okay. Now, does that mean all the animation gets done there, or yes. is there some of it done here? Uh, you you could potentially do some here if you had the resources or the time, but but generally it's all done overseas. So it sounds like this was made in like two months. I mean, yeah, it's it's a TV schedule. So like yeah. if this if this was TV, it would be like probably spaced out even a little bit better. But uh, you know, the the same amount of of time more or less, and, and people thrown at three half hours of TV, I guess. Uh, and do, do you have, do you remember how much uh, how many staff members like do we get here in the states? I I know obviously animators overseas, it, it's hard to probably tell that, but. Mm, like your yeah, team, I'm gonna say twenty, maybe twenty five. Okay. So twenty five people all working diligently, and you guys were was this made pre pre pandemic? Uh, yeah, but just barely. Like, uh, uh, we were doing post on. Actually, we we're doing post on the next one when the, the lockdown came. So this was like right before. So has your job changed? all that much uh i mean it's changed in that i'm no longer employed anywhere and i mostly just sit around uh petting my dog and <laughs> watching tv <laughs> okay i should have so, yeah should, it's, it's a different life now. differently <laughs> i guess what i meant was can you do your job from home just just this oh as... yeah like uh the, the, <laughs> the bits of stuff that i've done been able to do from home like we did some sound mixes, some records. Uh, uh, I've been doing some freelance design stuff. So yeah, it's it's one of the best industries probably for not leaving your house. One of the for not leaving your house. Yeah, I like that. I'd like since this is fan con, I'd like to talk with our fans uh, uh, virtually. Uh, I grabbed a couple fan questions. Hey fans. Hi, hi fans. Uh, so we have a couple fan questions. We're going to see what people are asking out there. Uh, real people, people that I definitely did not make up. And now, now it sounds like I did. Oh, geez. I'm just kidding. Uh, here we go. So Matt W. is asking, will we see more Hanna-Barbera cartoon alumni and possibly a resurgence of those characters back into mainstream cartoon pop culture? I think he's, he's asking you this probably in uh, keeping Scoob in mind because there was a lot of Hanna Barbera crossover in that movie. Well, I'm not I'm not sure how widely known this is, but there's actually a show coming out uh, run by C. H. Greenblatt, who did Chowder and a bunch of Billy and Mandy stuff, and it's called Jellystone, and it's literally just about every Hanna Barbera character you can think of mashed up together. <laughs> that's so, yes. cool. That that's a that's a TV series. Yeah. That is cool, and that's uh, happening right now, huh? Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, I know they've announced this, but I'm gonna have to go check now. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was. Uh, I was actually sitting in the the same area as that crew, uh, for a few months before this all went down. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's gonna be a lot of fun. That is a lot of fun. Okay, cool. Uh, we've got a question from. Well, it's listed as Shaggy. That was what this is. Individual... Is it why is Maxwell Adams so pale? Why does he look like Odo? It's no, that's uh, Space we'll, Nine. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> but Shaggy, Shaggy uh, is asking: Are we ever going to see a Scooby family reunion, bringing back Scooby Dumb, Scooby D, Scrappy Doo, etc.? <laughs> I don't know. I, I do know that that Scrappy and Scooby Dumb are not well liked. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean uh i don't i they just i think scrappy has like a bad rep for just being obnoxious and scooby dumb is unfortunately really dumb and also has the word dumb in his name which like <laughs> the people who make kids shows don't like <laughs> so are you telling me that when you name a character you got to be really careful because it's gonna you like you wouldn't want to name you know your kid Trixie, because you're just asking for trouble. Right. Yeah. Is it like that? 
Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, there was, uh, I actually got an email, not an email, like a Facebook message or something a, a year or two ago uh, where somebody was asking me why we had a character named Spurg on Billy and Mandy because they thought it was like a dig at people with Asperger's. But that slang what? didn't emerge until like a decade or more after that. So I was just like, <laughs> nope, what? it just sadly, uh, our our original writer had a, a friend with the last name Spurgle and they used to call him Spurg. And, that's what he's based on. <laughs> well, that's a bit of a stretch. I don't know that I would have ever made that leap. Some, sometimes, uh, you know, you're you're just a, a victim of the uh, shifting cultural tides and the meanings of words change. And and I think when Scooby Dumb came out, Dumb wasn't that big of a deal, and now Dumb's a big deal. So dumb maybe is... someday Dumb will come back and be Dumb again. <laughs> <laughs> don't name your character Dumb. That's the moral. That's the lesson here. What else maybe are you cooking up that you can or cannot say that is a project you are doing? Um, <laughs> that was That's not a good question. question. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm at the point now where I'm starting to pitch shows again, and I really can't talk about any of that. Okay. It's mysterious. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Mysterious in nature, or the the the. I just I I don't know. Like I I, I just don't want to say what they are because I don't want to misrepresent them here because sure. I'm not prepared to do that. That's that, that's fair. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's you know comedy shows, fun what comedy can, shows. Oh, what can you tell us about pitching in general? What uh, pitching in in the year 2020? How is that different than when you pitched Billy and Mandy? Uh. The, the thing is, like, I get a lot of questions, like, how do I get into the animation industry and stuff? Oh, and well, give, yeah. well, no, but I mean, it's it's a, it's a similar question where it's just like I used to feel like I had valid answers, but now, you know, I'm 20 years into my career, and, and when I pitched Billy and Mandy, like, uh, I, I got a job at Hanna-Barbera, and somebody came around, and they were like, hey, do you have any shows that you want to pitch? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I just kept dumping things into the mail and one day they wrote back and I that was weird I think even for the time and now like I, I don't know how things happen because you know I, I have people that I already know and I already have contacts and and basically now it's just like I come up with something and I'm like hey this is something I, I'm interested in and then I call people I know and let them know <laughs> so it's a it's a different ball game I guess okay you earlier you were saying something about how this new movie is part of a trilogy and, and you weren't uh, it didn't sound like you were super aware of that going yeah. into it. <laughs> true. Is that, that's true. Okay. Is, is there a, uh, and I, you know, with all due respect to all the parties involved is communication in animation, sort of a thing that is in need of work. <laughs> uh, maybe, I mean, I, I think communication is always good. Uh, yeah, you know they're making two of these a year plus, I don't know how many Batman's and Superman's and and whatever else, and that's just like one department among many in TV. So I would imagine keeping track of stuff is is rough <laughs> to some degree. It would have been nice, like everything just happened so fast. I guess I guess I've just learned to be adaptable, hopefully over the years. Okay, that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Yeah, I I uh, I love seeing films and animation specifically treated archivally. So that's that's why earlier I brought up you know Blu-ray. Um, I know I mentioned to you at one point that I think it'd be great if we saw a Billy and Mandy uh, collected season you know series as like one big volume. How much say do you ever get in that? And and do you think that the the fans out there have a chance to maybe uh, make something like that happen? fans always have influence i would say uh, definitely you know i've seen people have letter writing campaigns that that do affect outcomes of decisions at networks but yeah like as far as how much say i have in it for for cartoon network that's like done like uh they whenever whenever that was like 10 10 million ago at this point yeah like uh, i think it was it's uh, the cretaceous era like uh, yeah. back when i left cartoon network yeah um yeah. Yeah, they. I think they kind of divorced themselves from everything of that era, um, and only I 
think very, very recently has has that attitude started to kind of change. And in fact, they I think they have a different uh, studio head now as of this year. So maybe, maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, I you know I was thinking a lot about this, and some folks who've been paying attention to the the superhero news uh, may have paid attention to Warner and DC and the uh, Justice League getting a more proper release based off its original director, which is, I think, a huge uh, credit to fan passion and also, you know, studios listening to those fans. So the I... Snyder cut. The I Snyder cut. Was gonna cut. Happen. <laughs> What's that? I never thought it was going to happen. No, I mean, it, it's really... I don't think it's getting as much press as it should because it's kind of a... If anything, it's it's like set a bar, I think. And if people look at that, they may realize, if oh, it does well, like that'll be interesting. I think it will. It will be interesting. And so, you know, I also think with with our current um, state of social media, uh, there's there's more ways now to get people mobilized. And so, I went ahead and I created a little hashtag that I think would be fun to share with you. I know you haven't seen this oh, yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is, this is in honor of, uh, this is the only way they released it. I, maybe they released it digitally. I didn't check for, for digital, or, um, but they, it they probably only, is, it's probably digital also, but they, they only did DVD as far as physical media goes. They could have gone Blu-ray. I don't think it would have cost them much more if anything. Um, and the, but the same goes for like all the different Scooby-Doo series that came before, you know, uh, the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo and all that stuff. I think all those things should be properly released with Blu-ray. So here's what, where I'm leading this conversation is here's this hashtag Scooby blue. <laughs> where are you? I think you can still say Scooby blue. I, okay, good. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm going to encourage all the fans watching this. If you'd like to see, so, similar to what we're talking about here, that you know, a Blu-ray release for new content, but maybe collecting old uh, fa fan favorite uh, series that just where are they right now? Go ahead and post something about that and include Scooby Blue. Where are you? And maybe we can get something going. In addition to that, I made one more for you. Now this one's a little bit creepy sounding, but I'm going to do it anyway. Put, put some of those hash browns on there. Release Billy and Mandy. <laughs> Hashtag release Billy and Mandy. It makes it sound like maybe they were caged up somewhere. They could be. They could be. But I think we need to get Billy and Mandy a proper uh, shelf space. That's what yeah, I. Yeah, I'm all for it. Release yeah. those kids. And they could bring you. And they could bring you on board to have you do some some director commentary and all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah, that'd be fun. See, there you go. We have. Maxwell Adams is on is on board, folks. All we have to do is make it happen. So, for what it's worth, I think you did a great job honoring uh, this franchise as best you could with the resources you were given. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I well, mean, hopefully, uh, hopefully, most people won't know that we were in a crunch. <laughs> well, look, I, I I just watched it, and I I will say that I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know where the bar was, and I would for me. Um, if TV animation is here and if like, you know, theatrical full releases is here, I'd say you landed somewhere in between. Cool. I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it exactly with, I, I think the nice thing is like, I, I was really beating myself up during the, the post-production, but at the end of the day, the, the nice thing is it's, it's Scooby-Doo. And I think thankfully because it's Scooby-Doo, there's like a little bit of forgiveness from all, all those years of, you know, uh, Somebody's going to come out of that barrel. It's, well, it's differently. <laughs> okay, well, so, you know, it's okay. It's okay. To your, to your point, you know, before fans get too riled up about, how, you know, I don't know what quality it's, it's going for, lest we not forget, go back and watch the 1969 series and where they really milked a run cycle, you know? Oh, yeah. You're not doing that. I mean, it looked like I didn't really see a lot of stuff get duplicated. Yeah, I mean, we, we didn't do any, uh, I mean, there are, you know, some looping backgrounds in that highway chase, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a modern animated show, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the colors I think are bright. I think, um, 
and not just bright, but I mean, it's pleasing to the eye and clean looking. The the lip sync, as far as I could tell, was was matching. Yeah, like like thankfully we we did have like a great crew on this, just pulling everything together. So, what's top of the priority list? Like sometimes, like the the sad thing is on a, a TV budget and schedule, like you will just run out of time. Uh, that has happened before, where there's like there's always more you could do, but every now and then you get to the point where like just like five more hours or two more hours, and this you know I could I could push it up a notch, but I just don't have the time. So, do you ever find yourself putting hours in and it's not being logged? You're just like, look, I cannot. Uh, I mean, yeah, like at the when 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 you're sort of at the writer producer director at the same time level like you're negotiating your own contract like i'm not literally doing three jobs so right i uh, i'm getting paid more than any one of those people but i'm also sort of signing away my normal human work week <laughs> like so the, the deal is off. like i i have this contract and and i will get paid this per week but i also got to get stuff done <laughs> You are a mad doctor at that point, and you are like a, a, an evil scientist, but you're also a literal doctor because you're on call 24-7. Yeah, like it's uh, – you just got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> do you get to work directly with any of the the talent, the the voice actors? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, – I still go to records. Uh, sometimes I even have to direct records, which is not necessarily my favorite thing, but – oh. Uh, yeah, uh, I got to go to all the records for this thing. Um, everybody was great. Uh, the whole, it's a great cast. Like I, I worked with uh, Great Delisle and uh, Frank Loger before, obviously, but uh, Kate Micucci is fantastic. She's the only Velma I've ever worked with, but she's my favorite Velma. <laughs> um, and Matthew Lillard's fantastic. Um, yeah, Elvira was great. Bill Nye was amazing. It was all good. Did you contribute? a voice at some point because i know you did in billy and mandy uh no no not not for this one okay i was looking for a spider in the background <laughs> <laughs> are there any easter eggs uh, uh, that are non scooby-doo property that you were able to stick back in there in the film somewhere uh yeah there's tons like uh just all of that sort of 1980s horror stuff like uh some of the cars are like there's a car that's kind of inspired by christine and there's uh i mean there's a billy and mandy parade float <laughs> well that's what yeah. i that's kind of where there's i was a fairly at. obvious nod to predator toward the end okay <laughs> which you know normally uh i'm kind of over predator references but that one made me giggle for some reason well i thought i saw i thought i saw grim in that parade float i really wanted to see yeah that, that was that was intentional Okay. Okay. Well, I, you know, look, it could have been anything. It could have been just a random Grim Reaper and just coincidental, but I, I wasn't sure how that, how that worked, but uh, I was happy to see a, uh, him make uh, an appearance and show his skeletal form. Yeah. I, I guess most of the references are more Scooby stuff. It's very Scooby centric. It is very Scooby centric. There are a lot of references to, what little I know of of the Scooby universe, I, I I caught a few things too. So I'm sure fans will appreciate that, and um, I hope everyone picks up a copy and enjoys Happy Halloween, Scooby Doo. Yeah, me too. Happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween, Maxwell. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna go out into the Halloween night and get a suntan because I need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having you. I look forward to talking with you in the future, and uh, don't eat too much candy, okay? I'll try. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this round of FanCon 2020, the Scooby-Doo panel. Please stick around because I've got a lot more show for you coming up. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.